Um, welcome, um, everybody. It's a great pleasure um, to chair the following the panel um, with prominent um, figures to talk about some of the issues that have been raised. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce you uh, quickly. The stop is um, Laurent Babican. He's uh, Director of uh, Capital Markets at the Carbon uh, Disclosure, uh, Disclosure Project and also a member of the Executive Committee. Um, I don't know if everybody can see him. Um, we have Bertrand de Massier, Director General at the European Investment Bank, Andrea Rexer, Head of Institutional Affairs, uh, Corporate Sustainability and Communication at Typo Vereinsbank in Munich, and um, Jakob Thoma, Managing Director at the uh, Two um, Degrees Investing Initiatives, um, Germany. Um, also, a couple of housekeeping notes. We have, uh, as always, a hashtag here. It's um, hashtag Zeit für Klima, if you want to comment on what we're doing on Twitter. If you have questions, please use questions, please use Slido, and then I can pick them up. And of course, there's always the opportunity to discuss in the chat, uh, use chat function to discuss and um, to do the networking. Um, I'd like to start off with um, uh, with Andrea. Um, you know, the issues are clear. We have the summit um, today. Um, we have many initiatives um, in, in the direction of climate neutrality. Um, from, from the a point of your institution, um, how much, uh, how relevant is the climate issue, you know, in the in the daily operations of allocating uh, allocating capital, you know, of um, of uh, um, giving loans to corporates or um, consumers? Thank you, Mark, for the question. I think that's a very important point because these kind of risks are getting every day more important. So. Um, all sustainability issues are deeply embedded now in our um, business strategy. So it is one of the issues we look at every client. It is one of um, um, the points we are talking to with every client meeting, being it private customers who ask us, how can I invest my money uh, into contributing to a more sustainable future? And also the company clients or the, um, the bigger companies uh, we are talking to. And um, actually we have developed um, ESG heat map, we call it, where we have, do have a structured approach to go through the basic questions with our clients to know where they stand. So this uh, plays into the issue of transparency that uh, Mr. Loeffler just mentioned. So we, we need to have more, we need to have all those data, all those facts to judge the risk, as you said, Mark, because uh, this is one of the most relevant topics uh, when we talk to our clients right now. Mm. Um, turning over to um, Jakob, um, is this kind of approach that is being used, I mean, you show sure you, you see what corporates and banks are doing in Germany and, and, and in the entire world, is that uh, what we need, or did, uh, you know, does the framework need some improvement to allow for more ESG and investment decisions? So I, there's definitely room for improvement, for sure. Um, some of this is uh, an ideal world where we'd like to have some of the sustainability data that's just really hard to capture. But some of this is also just a better understanding of what the actual question is that you're asking yourself when you're using these types of tools and, and data sets, right? Uh, when we think about uh, the ultimate customer here in this equation, the retail investor, uh, you know, a threshold of a company, many of these ESG head maps, for example, say a company doesn't have coal if less than 10% of its business is in the coal sector. A retail investor, many of them which we survey, say no coal means no coal. Zero percent is their reference point. That doesn't make that 10% figure wrong. That just means that when you're serving a client who says no coal means no coal, then that's the indicator that you should be looking at. So that's, I think, an important part is rather than always trying to think about the metrics in a vacuum saying, we really need to be smarter at differentiating uh, the, the actual objective and the diversity of objectives that a retail customer, an institutional customer, or, or other stakeholders have in, in the ecosystem, perhaps civil society. I think the, the second aspect is that um, as Karsten already highlighted, this is a transition process. So a lot of the ways we think about corporates uh, today is still based on the things they've done in the past. When we think about the oil and gas companies, we think about the business they used to have. We think about the car makers business they used to have. I think we need to be better and smarter and, and just more forward looking in terms of trying to um, understand the business those companies are planning to have in the future. Uh, and some of that is based obviously on the targets that companies are setting themselves, which are laudable, but some of that is also accountability around those targets. Um, 
uh, the, this morning, uh, I saw ExxonMobil advertise its carbon capture and storage system, which is, I think, 0.1% of the emissions that they have uh, on, on an annual basis. So I think we need to both have some respect and consideration of these targets, but also make sure we have the right accountability that transition is not just improving, but improving at a pace consistent with, um, with what is needed to meet climate goals. Uh, Laurent, uh, one of the central you know, tenets of uh, free market economy, economy is basically that the market reflects real world scarcities, right? So um, if, you, if you look at the climate issue, do you think that the market actually um, does that? So does it work? Does it function properly? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I had a problem. Uh, connect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Mark for the question. Yeah, no, I don't think the market now are pricing uh, this uh, because just simply uh, we could consider that the market are efficient if we had the price of all externalities, which is not the case now. And uh, we've been discussing for 20 years about the carbon price. We had some attempts so to do things. It's absolutely not working. Uh, and we need to have a price on carbon, we need to have a price on water, we need to have a price on forests and pollution of any externalities. And the day we will have this, uh, we will for sure have the numerator of the discounted model cash flow, you know, which we use to calculate so the price of the stock, which will be much lower. So uh, now it doesn't take this into account. That's uh, number one. And number two, uh, the, in terms of macroeconomic uh, uh, indicators, they are just wrong now. They don't represent anymore the reality. So we need to find a system where we reinvent the macroeconomic indicators. Things like uh, GDP doesn't reflect anything anymore. It takes for granted that we use nature for free at a free cost, which is not the case anymore. And uh, inflation is wrongly calculated. And the way you calculate inflation makes the central bank behave in one way or another if you are above or below the target. So if we have the right indicators at hand, plus the right price of externalities, then we could consider potentially, and I would like to see that uh, live, uh, that the market are pricing well, the company on the market or any, any, any type of, uh, of, uh, of instrument or financial, uh, financial uh, product. Okay. Uh, Petronimus, yeah, I would like to take, uh, to push that a little further. So how, you know, how can we get to this? ideal um, world where actually um, you know everything is uh, correctly uh, externalities externalities are correctly internalized and then let's just let the market work let's let the, let's let the market work how do we get there what would be the steps uh, that need to be taken any ideas oh. hello sorry can you hear me yeah now now you okay okay uh, uh well, uh, th thank you very much for the question. First of all, it's a pleasure to 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 be to be to be with you and to participate to this uh, discussion. Um, uh, okay, maybe maybe be be because I'm I'm French, uh, I will never believe that markets will be totally totally left on their own. And I think that's a general European view is that markets also have to work hand in hand with uh, with also uh, supervisors, uh, decision makers, and actually citizens, citizens who are those who elect the uh, decision makers, the politicians, and the politicians are those who appoint the the, the supervisors. And all this is actually uh, the best in a in the democratic world. Uh, however, markets have a, a, a role to play, and I think that the nice thing about about um, climate and environment, if you uh, if you ask my view, is that markets have have been rather good and have rather delivered since the start of uh, green bond issuance in uh, 2007. In a way, the, the start of green bond issuance really introduced to uh, capital markets introduced uh, to banks, to intermediaries, to investors, uh, the notion of uh, the concept and the simple concept of uh, eligibility, of allocation of proceeds to certain means, but you cannot allocate proceeds to certain means without reporting, without explaining, and without also justifying, meaning without uh, developing some impact measurements. And when you look at what's been done since 2007, uh, and again, within, uh, within a, a coordination that was rather rapidly forming with the Green Bond principles, uh, you, you, you could see that uh, there has been the creation of a relatively well understood and relatively clear consensus 
that allowed, after all, if you look at it uh, now, if you look at the green bond markets or the short term markets, the number of occurrences where uh, there has been really mis-selling, I would say. Uh, you, you, I don't, I'm not even sure you have to, you, to use your two hands. I think only one hand is enough to count them. Now, again, uh, markets cannot do uh, everything uh, of ourselves. Uh, I think the, 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 the citizens, I think the end investor, and especially the retail investor, the retail uh, the, 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 the small enterprise uh, need clear guidance, need clear guarantees, need clear firewalls, and this is the reason why uh, quite normally uh, the, the politicians and the supervisors come into play. And I think that Europe on that front has been uh, rather on, uh, let's say, the, the front, uh, the, the, the leader, the, the, the thought leader until now. We'll see how it changes with China and the United States. And actually, it's very good to be now emulated and to have competitors. But Europe has been uh, quite good at that. And uh, even the, even if it's not perfect, and even if there are discussions, the release of the delegated act, the first delegated act on the taxonomy uh, yesterday is, is, is quite an achievement. Let's, let's talk about let's talk a little about uh, the issue of transparency because um, whether it's sufficient or not, at least I think everyone we all would agree that it's necessary um, for the market to work. So, um, what is the state here? Do we do we need uh, more transparency with respect to you know if I want to buy a green product, it, I can be sure it, it is actually green. Um, and and where should that come from? Should that be government led or civil society or uh, or industry players? Who should be in the lead here in coming up with these standards? So it's free for anyone. So if you want to say something, just go ahead. I'll try to see you on the screen. Yeah. I think Jakob. Yeah. 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 Jakob and Laurent. Uh, sure. So I think there's actually, we're really in, in two different worlds here. Um, a sophisticated, and I'll use this inverted comma, sophisticated institutional investors, large insurance companies and pension funds, they've really stepped up their game, larger banks. Uh, Unicredit, so you provide Bank being one of them. They've really uh, are in a much uh, better position to really understand what companies are doing and to 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 trace uh, to use transparency as a way to inform decision making. I think the big, big, big challenge we have is also in the spirit of what Bertrand said about retail mm -hmm. investors. I think this is a huge problem. Um, let's take green bonds. Uh, green bonds are products where the use of proceeds is earmarked for green projects. Retail investors think green bonds are issued by green companies. We can, whether they're right or they're wrong, that kind of distinction just means that trans, when you're selling a green bond fund, retail investors are systematically confused. Um, in Germany, we set up um, a platform called meinvermögen.de, uh, which allows retail investors to look at the 5,000 or 6,000 plus funds that they are um, that they can invest in in the German market and understand the range of. ESG and climate criteria around them. And that's really where it gets really hard because that's where they have limited understanding of the issues in finance. They don't have the big teams behind them. They have very particular objectives and transparency doesn't work at all, or it works very limited because again, not to say that this is wrong or right. They have a very different understanding of what things like green mean. They, they don't understand why one of the largest ESG funds in Europe has as its largest company in the fund McDonald's. I mean, with for all the good reasons that it might be in there, they don't they don't understand that, and they actually have really bespoke interests. That's why I think much much more is needed on the regulatory side. Uh, also, the banker retail investor relationship uh, plays a crucial crucial role here. That the frontline bank officer in a small Sparkasse uh, somewhere in in Lower Saxony is equipped with the tools to bring that conversation to the market. Because I think the private investors that Andrea is talking about are often already sort of wealthy investors who have some capabilities but bringing that scaling that across the market and that can only be achieved with a meaningful policy intervention yeah i can build on that and I tell uh, everybody that there is an excellent tool for the retail investor to understand where they invest their money it's called climetrics uh, we are uh, rating 20,000 firm there is a free to access website climetrics uh, you google it and you find it and we give uh, the rating with the leaf system. So uh, a fund that has one leaf is a fund that is uh, not climate friendly or environmental friendly. And the best scoring is five leaves, where we take into account climate change, water, and forest. And a five leaf fund is a fund that is that has already started transitioning to a, a, 
uh, low carbon world, water resilient world, and deforestation free world. So there are some tools out there. Jacob mentioned uh, before uh, another platform that uh, that is uh, available in Germany, and um, um, those tools from Climatrix is scoring one third of the mutual fund market in the world. So now you know that if you put as a return investor your money in a five leaf fund, you're doing good. Uh, much better than if you were investing in a three leaf fund. So you can ask your banker and the banker and the, uh, and the financial advisor would be obliged to ask the preference uh, with the MIFID II regulation of the end user, what do you want to invest in and give me uh, your, your choices, your preferences, and then I will have as a financial advisor, I would be obliged to propose you something uh, in this line. And to come back to the transparency issue, it's crucial. The transparency issue is absolutely crucial and this is what we're doing at CDP. We are the largest uh, environmental reporting platform in the world in which you have something like 10,000 companies responding, but also city, state and region. And we try to give uh, an output which is a data that is uh, that can support any kind of, uh, of standard or framework. I won't get into that, it's too technical. But the output is a data that can be comparable between geographies, sectors, and uh, uh, companies so that the investor can do his job uh, in terms of E from the ESG. We're only dealing with the environmental side. And, um, and um, we need more of that because as, uh, as uh, Jacob said, we are mainly uh, talking about large companies. Then we need to go to all the SMB companies, to the smaller companies, and it's getting there. I'm very happy to see yesterday uh, the, 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 the renaming of this ex-NFRG uh, uh, directive. Now it's we concern the companies not over 500 uh, people, but I think over 250. So we're going from 11,000 potential companies to 40,000 companies in Europe. And that's very good. So we need to do more of that. And we are a thought leader in Europe. We need to keep the momentum on that. And um, I'm very much now uh, looking for the ESG reporting standard that is being uh, uh, now uh, uh, on the table. And, um, and yes, that's, we need to do more of that. It's fundamental. Andrea, Maybe it's, I uh, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe I can add something to that as well, because I think it's absolutely crucial what Jacob and Lauren just said. And I just want to state clearly that sometimes people think that companies or financial institutions would step up against clear regulation. And I think the opposite is true, because it's in our interest to have a clear and transparent and strong regulation on those things. Because as Jacob said, we don't want to have um, a competition where some people interpret figures others than others do, because that would mislead the customer. That's not in our interest. We have been one of the pioneers and uh, in, in the whole ESG investing area. So I think we need both. We need the investment of private companies like Laurence, um, giving data and um, um, making things more transparent and more comparable between the companies and uh, we also need a strong regulation that sets the benchmark you know that sets goals and that helps us um, to to reach the net zero um even uh, even more quick and um if, if you take an example it's also um interesting if you look at the risk management mark you mentioned that in your first question um that risk management and managing climate risk is is really crucial and think about um financing a coal company for example it's a lot easier for us as a bank if we have clear goals clear political goals and then we can judge the risk in a much easier way um if we have no transparency then we we it's difficult it's, it's, it's difficult for us to judge uh, the risk. So um, I think it's 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 the interest of the financial sector to have a clear regulation. See, this, that's also what I read on Slido. So uh, a couple of people mentioned um, the issue that would it be easier for banks, for the financial sector uh, to perform its function if there were clear prices and goals on CO2 emissions and uh, maybe to Bertrand. So uh, is that the key? You know, do, do we need the government to set the price and uh, go ahead with, it, with these measures and, and then the banks can operate on that basis. What's your view? Um, yeah, 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 well, in fact, I, I agree with uh, everything that uh, that uh, that was said. Uh, and, and, and actually coming back perhaps to the, first of all, the issue of the president of the retail investor, uh, uh, I think that, again, the, the, the EU taxonomy is a very important step forward because we, you're no longer today speaking 
of allocating proceeds to projects, which is indeed extremely granular. And so it opens the possibility that granularity, the granularity will allow a bad company to have a nice green project, and then everybody is lost because uh, this company may issue a green bond. Now, the, 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 the taxonomy is about activity, and activity is much larger, it's much less granular, and it's much closer to the true essence of a company. And so let's be frank, For, for uh, starting from now, uh, uh, to, to issue a, 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 a green or social bond, uh, a company will have to be actually, we have to comply with the do not harm principle, and we have to be actually much uh, true to its own uh, body, uh, its whole entity will have to be much more closer to the goals than, than before. So I would I would say that again, we are, we are really uh, uh, going in the right direction. You're right to mention that, uh, you're right to mention that also, um, uh, well, first of all, also as an issuer, as an issuer, we are, for example, at the EBI, we're issuing because we are financing investments and we're financing lending. And it is true. Uh, what, what I said about the fact that uh, an issuer now is cannot cannot be satisfied and will not be taken seriously because the the, the, the regulation will prevent that. Can will not be will no longer be taken seriously if he issues a green bond and continue to do very bad things. At the same time, a lender like EIB has also, and I, I totally, I totally uh, uh, agree with uh, with um, the, the, the other panelists. We have to 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 score its own uh, climate risk taking, and we have to actually con start selecting its risk and uh, and uh, allocating its capital according to climate risk metrics as well. You're right also uh, to say that, for example, carbon price is an important uh, is an important uh, uh, parameter uh, on this you know that uh, within our policy our uh, what we call our climate bank roadmap which is the actually the, the strategy for aligning uh, EAB to the Paris um, uh, goals the Paris conference goals you you know that we have decided to set up a, a, a carbon price uh, in uh, and we published it so so it's as uh, a secret that which is much higher than the current market prices, which is at, at uh, 80 uh, euros uh, the CO2 term. Uh, and actually, it's a price that will increase to, uh, I don't remember the exact figure, I'm sorry, but it's on the website uh, to, if I'm not mistaken, uh, more than 200 in uh, 2050. Um, it shows that, it shows two things. It shows that, uh, uh, yes, you we set this price because there's, a uh, whole regulation that forces us to to uh, to demonstrate and to measure impact and to report on impact, but it also shows that each individual entity has the possibility to uh, also set its own standard within the regulation and to be more or less, actually more or less uh, ambitious uh, in setting its own standards. Uh, the, 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 the nicety about the, the regulation and especially the taxonomy is that it will allow uh, the rest of the world to understand uh, how the standard put forward by a market player uh, stands against the definition of uh, activities that do good or do not harm. Okay, yeah, uh, good point. Um, I'd like to take this a little further. So, um, so we agree that it would be good to have good government regulations, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the reality is on a global level, they are not there and we don't know when they will come. Um, so how much can we expect from, you know, private market participants, uh, companies, banks, to go ahead and at what you know uh, and how, to what extent can we rely on them to do the work uh, even in the absence of the necessary government um, regulations I, I, I will I will say only one thing and then I'll leave the fourth orders but when you look at what happened in the United States you can be relatively confident that again markets can act even without regulation the United States in the past four years were the example of bad regulation on the federal level but actually a lot of activities and good activities taking place at the level of municipalities of, of, of investors institutional investors and even even states. I mean, we can see that at, uh, at uh, CDP, the number of a list you know, we score the company, so we are, we are this reporting platform that will also give us an environmental score that measure environmental performance of corporation. There are, there are um, a good number of A in the US, so even at that time, uh, the federal government uh, did not work 
but I agree with you below uh, at, the, at the company level or uh, the states, uh, the regional level, it was uh, it was working. Um, so um, I wanted to 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 say something about uh, okay. If we don't have the policy, it's coming. Every country now is trying to build its policy, but then the company they have a, a, a leading role to play, and they can play a role also for the supply chain of the company. You now, if a company asks its own suppliers, and you know, take a BMW, BMW has I don't know maybe 10,000, 20,000 suppliers, maybe more, to um, um, diminish their emission uh, to work with uh, with uh, BMW. Um, I'm talking about carbon emission, but it can also be on water, it can also be on other aspects of environmental uh, uh, elements, then it has a fantastic power to accelerate uh, the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, when a company is uh, taking a commitment to be uh, what we call net zero, one, yeah, I don't want to enter into the debate, there were 1.5 degree aligned by 2050, they won't be able to do that only on their own activities and production. They will have to uh, embed with them all their suppliers, because if their suppliers won't decrease the emissions they need to do to sell the product to BMW, then BMW will never be able uh, to reach this level, because we know that this, what we call the scope tree is at least 80% of the total scope of the company. So when a company, a big company, asks the supplier, hey guys, you need to decrease your emissions to work with me, it's all good for the system in its kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's done by the private sector. Um, and all those commitments that we have now on the market, yesterday there was a launch of, uh, of an alliance, the net zero banking alliance with 43 banks. Um, they are committing to be net zero uh, it means that they need to decrease the, 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 the carbon footprint of their loans and their investment. And it's quite the, the commitment they have to sign is quite tough. So if they do exactly that, now it's time for action. It's time we need to stop talking and we need to act. And if the bank is changing the way it's financing the, the, the corporates, the corporations, by putting some, uh, some condition to the loan, you know, I'm thinking about sustainability linked loans, that's all good for the system. And I will end there. Uh, we, we made a report with Oliver Wyman that shows in Europe there is a four trillion gap between the money that the bank that says that they want to be net zero line wants to invest or to finance and the reality of the corporation. Uh, we have something called the science based target. There are very few number of science based target corporations that could receive this money. So we need to accelerate that to make the matching. That's it. Andrea, at, at, at your, uh, thank you. Uh, at your institution, right? So um, let's say you're, you, have a, you're, you have legacy assets, right? You have coal and, and whatnot. Um, how, how do you deal with this? You know, Do you tell these companies, well, you better get out or you are out? Um, or is this a debate? So how, how, does it, how does this work in practice? Yeah, as you said, Mark, before that, there's a high interest of having clear internal policies, even if uh, the, the the public policies are not there yet, because um, we don't want to have stranded assets, to be frank, you know. Um, so climate risks are there if we want them to have or not. So we can't deny that they are simply there. So we take that into account, of course. But I think it's not about dropping clients. This is this would do harm to society, and we always have to take in all 17 sustainable development goals so it's not about dropping clients it's about accompanying them in throughout the transition process so we work with our clients going through the heat map and advising them how to be more compliant how to get emissions down etc cetera, etc cetera. and we have a clear pathway so we accompany them and i see this as a transit as a transition and uh, we, we we are not throwing anyone out but we work with those who we where we see that they take it seriously and that they want to change so it's about fostering change and not about throwing people out Maybe, Mark, if I could just um, answer this this question of can the kind of companies uh, save the party. So, I mean, I, I want to push back a little bit on what Laurent said. I don't think companies are in any way more ambitious than governments. They're not there to save the party. A bank setting a 2050 net zero target, a European bank, when the government sets the same target, is basically just saying, well, the government's going to achieve net zero. I will as a bank as well in 2050. 
I'm retired at that point anyway. Sure, there's intermediate steps, but I think we need to be a bit clear eyed about the core interests of profit making that companies have. I think one thing that companies potential really is different from uh, some of the government incentives is that they are in some rawer way exposed to some of the pressures of their customers. And that makes certain types of companies more inclined to be ambitious than governments might be that even though they're linked to democratic processes can in, in many cases have less of that direct if i'm not taking action i'm losing customers tomorrow type of dynamic that that policymakers might might not face in that direct uh, relationship so i don't i don't i do think we need to be careful about um assuming that companies are there to save the party i don't think there's any evidence that companies are being more ambitious in aggregate than government. There are clearly leaders and banks and corporates that are setting science-based targets or uh, like Unicredit really putting, making climate and people finance, I'm sorry, making climate a core part of their business. But there's a long, long, long tail of the private sector that's in no man's land. And uh, I think uh, right now we are definitely erring on the side of putting faith in the private sector to save the party. I think that faith is misplaced if governments don't step up as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um... This is one of the thoughts I also had. I mean, you know, the government, of course, have the executive power and they can set the rules and they could solve the problem uh, relatively quickly if they wanted to, but they don't. I mean, in many countries, it takes time and internationally, um, it takes even more time. So, uh, so I still, to, to um, talk a little bit about this question, um, of course, companies are not uh, do-gooders, right? They want to make money. Um, but how uh, how far can you push them? I mean, they don't operate in a vacuum, right? So they're civil society, they're institutions uh, that, like some of of some of you are you represent. So how far can you push them um, to actually, you know, do this, perform this 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 role? Um, push them, yeah. In fact, you can help them uh, to, <laughs> rather than push. Actually, I, I would say. I would speak of what we we we, we do here uh, or try to do. The the first one is to uh, well certainly there are things that we 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 tell them we don't want to do any longer. For example, you know that uh, we have an energy lending policy that uh, actually uh, forces us because it's a self imposition, but forces us to stop any any fines to uh, uh, energy production out of gas uh, at uh, as of the end of this year. So that's so that's the first uh, first thing to do, which is just to stop offering your the, the companies uh, some product, unfortunately to them perhaps uh, some 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 opportunities, but they are opening uh, new opportunities to them. Uh, and, and, and what does it mean? It means, for example, that we are uh, now developing. Uh, I would say with uh, with uh, various uh, with uh, various partners, we are developing investment vehicles. We are developing uh, new uh, lending products for uh, investments into digital investments into climate mitigation investment into uh, climate adaptation. So, so we tend to put forward in a, a, in the front of our product offer, so to speak. Uh, the right product uh, for um, uh, financing the the transition to uh, to uh, uh, a better economy. Speaking of transition, uh, we will include in our climate bank roadmap, and this is something that we are developing at the moment, so it's ongoing work. But we will include in our uh, strategy uh, a transition plan, uh, meaning that we will we are working to develop a comprehensive proposal that we will uh, deliver this year. Uh, to uh, that will be centered uh, around regions or communities or companies who are most exposed to risk from a rapid transition to low carbon economy, taking into consideration in particular as much as we can the, the social uh, the social aspect the social development uh, dimension more broadly. Uh, so, so there will be, I would say, special, special, uh, special instruments developed uh, on that front. And as to the others, and it's between guiding and guiding and helping. Uh, again, I come back to what I said: the lender now can no longer uh, uh, be a lender as it used to be uh, 15 years ago, or 10 years ago. It has to include. It has to include. Uh, um, uh, consideration on the way uh, its counterparties align on uh, on uh, 
uh, on the uh, Paris uh, imperatives. And we are developing as well a framework uh, whereby we will no longer look at the project or the activity that a company asks us to finance, but we will actually look, we will complement our analysis of the project with actually an analysis and also uh, offer to uh, of uh, advisory services, but an analysis of the uh, of the aligned of the wider activities of the counterparty, and and, and uh, I think also uh, I should have mentioned that earlier, um, the, the 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 delivery of advisory service is quite important, and and you know that under the the younger plan, we developed together with the Commission and national institution an advisory hub that is already working and working a lot. I can tell you, especially with companies and counterparties. I would say in the most fragile part of Europe, and after all, it's where the, uh, the needs are the more acute. Thank, thank you. So we have only two minutes left. Just quickly, you know, uh, please a quick answer. Um, climate management and climate risk is, also, is about what you don't finance anymore, but also what you do finance, right? So yeah. uh, how to how to make that transition um, possible on the on the side of giving money to companies that are the future, and uh, maybe um, Andrea. Um, where, you know, what role does this, does this play? How important is this in your context? Um, I just want to strengthen what Bertrand just said that we have, um, when you take the whole picture, so let me take this a bit further, we have to focus on all aspects of the 17 SDGs. As uh, he said, he, he's um, looking very deeply into the social um, parameter, we are too. Um, we have created a, a, a new unit that is called Social Impact Banking, where we um, transform or we try to, to foster society as a whole, because I think that the past months have clearly shown how important um, the societal um, aspects of ESG are. So I think um, there's a lot ahead of us and there's a lot of factors to take into account um, if we are heading towards the ultimate goal, which would be that our whole book would be um, uh, ESG conform, I'd say, so that we wouldn't have the debate about ESG as such because we would know that all of the assets are compliant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But we really have to leave it um, at there. I have tons of questions. <laughs> Time is out, which is a good sign. Um, I thank you very much for being on that panel and discussing this with us. Uh, I learned a lot. We are the, you know, the direction is right. A lot of stuff happened, but more stuff needs to happen if we want, if we want to achieve our goals. So thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce the next panel. And I uh, guess for this, I switch to German again. Zwischen globalen Ambitionen und lokalen Realitäten, wie weltweit agierende Unternehmen Komplexität auf dem Weg zur Nachhaltigkeit managen related to what we are discussing here. Um, und das macht mein Kollege Jens Tönnismann. Dankeschön. Um, thank you all. Um, see you soon. Thanks. Dankeschön. Hi. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.